Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. The Blue Castle by Lucy Maud Montgomery Chapter 33 Spring Mistawi's black and sullen for a week or two, then flaming in sapphire and turquoise, lilac and rose again, laughing through the oriole, caressing its amethyst islands, rippling under wind soft as silk. Frogs, little green wizards of swamp and pool, singing everywhere in the long twilights and long into the nights, islands fairy-like in a green haze, the evanescent beauty of wild young trees in early leaf, frost-like loveliness of the new foliage of juniper trees, the woods putting on a fashion of spring flowers, dainty, spiritual things akin to the soul of the wilderness, red mist on the maples, willows decked out with glossy silver pussies, all the forgotten violets of Mistawi's blooming. Again, lure of April moons. Think how many thousands of springs have been here on Mistawi's, and all of them beautiful, said Valency. Oh, Barney, look at that wild plum. I will, I must quote from John Foster. There's a passage in one of his books, I've reread it a hundred times. He must have written it before a tree just like that, behold the young wild plum tree which has adorned herself after immemorial fashion in a wedding veil of fine lace. The fingers of wood pixies must have woven it, for nothing like it ever came from an earthly loom. I vow the tree is conscious of its loveliness. It is bridling before our very eyes, as if its beauty were not the most ephemeral thing in the woods, as it is the rarest and most exceeding, for today it is and tomorrow it is not. Every south wind purring through the boughs will winnow away a shower of slender petals. But what matter? Today it is queen of the wild places and it is always today in the woods. I'm sure you feel much better since you've got that out of your system, said Barney heartlessly. Here's a patch of dandelions, said Valency, unsubdued. Dandelions shouldn't grow in the woods, though. They haven't any sense of the fitness of things at all. They are too cheerful and self-satisfied. They haven't any of the mystery and reserve of the real wood flowers. In short, they've no secrets, said Barney. But wait a bit. The woods will have their own way even with those obvious dandelions. In a little while all that obtrusive yellowness and complacency will be gone and we'll find here misty, phantom-like globes hovering over those long grasses in full harmony with the traditions of the forest. That sounds John Fosterish, teased Valency. What have I done that deserved a slam like that? complained Barney. One of the earliest signs of spring was the renaissance of Lady Jane. Barney put her on roads that no other car would look at, and they went through deerwood in mud to the axles. They passed several sterlings, who groaned and reflected that now spring was come they would encounter that shameless pair everywhere. Valency, prowling about deerwood shops, met Uncle Benjamin on the street, but he did not realize until he had gone two blocks further on that the girl in the scarlet-collared blanket coat, with cheeks reddened in the sharp April air and the fringe of black hair over laughing, slanted eyes, was Valency. When he did realize it, Uncle Benjamin was indignant. What business had Valency to look like, like, like a young girl? The way of the transgressor was hard. Had to be. Scriptural and proper. Yet Valency's path couldn't be hard. She wouldn't look like that if it were. There was something wrong. It was almost enough to make a man turn modernist. Barney and Valency clanged on to the port, so that it was dark when they went through Deerwood again. At her old home Valency, seized with a sudden impulse, got out, opened the little gate and tiptoed around to the sitting-room window. There sat her mother and cousin Stickles drearily, grimly knitting. Baffling and inhuman as ever. If they had looked the least bit lonesome Valency would have gone in. But they did not. Valency would not disturb them for worlds. Chapter 34 Valency had two wonderful moments that spring. One day, coming home through the woods, 
with her arms full of trailing arbutus and creeping spruce, she met a man who she knew must be Alan Tierney. Alan Tierney, the celebrated painter of beautiful women. He lived in New York in winter, but he owned an island cottage at the northern end of Mistawis to which he always came the minute the ice was out of the lake. He was reputed to be a lonely, eccentric man. He never flattered his sitters. There was no need to, for he would not paint anyone who required flattery. To be painted by Alan Tierney was all the cachet of beauty a woman could desire. Valency had heard so much about him that she couldn't help turning her head back over her shoulder for another shy, curious look at him. A shaft of pale spring sunlight fell through a great pine athwart her bare black head and her slanted eyes. She wore a pale green sweater and had bound a fillet of linnea vine about her hair. The feathery fountain of trailing spruce overflowed her arms and fell around her. Alan Tierney's eyes lighted up. I've had a caller, said Barney the next afternoon, when Valency had returned from another flower quest. Who? Valency was surprised but indifferent. She began filling a basket with Arbutus. Alan Tierney. He wants to paint you, Moonlight. Me. Valency dropped her basket and her Arbutus. You're laughing at me, Barney. I'm not. That's what Tierney came for. To ask my permission to paint my wife, as the spirit of Muskoka, or something like that. But, but, stammered Valency, Alan Tierney never paints any but, any but, beautiful women, finished Barney. Conceded. Q. E. D., Mistress Barney Snaith is a beautiful woman. Nonsense, said Valency, stooping to retrieve her Arbutus. You know that's nonsense, Barney. I know I'm a heap better looking than I was a year ago, but I'm not beautiful. Alan Tierney never makes a mistake, said Barney. You forget, Moonlight, that there are different kinds of beauty. Your imagination is obsessed by the very obvious type of your cousin Olive. Oh, I've seen her, she's a stunner, but you'd never catch Alan Tierney wanting to paint her. In the horrible but expressive slang phrase, she keeps all her goods in the shop window. But in your subconscious mind you have a conviction that nobody can be beautiful who doesn't look like Olive. Also, you remember your face as it was in the days when your soul was not allowed to shine through it. Tierney said something about the curve of your cheek as you looked back over your shoulder. You know I've often told you it was distracting. And he's quite batty about your eyes. If I wasn't absolutely sure it was solely professional, he's really a crabbed old bachelor, you know, I'd be jealous. Well, I don't want to be painted, said Valency. I hope you told him that. I couldn't tell him that. I didn't know what you wanted. But I told him I didn't want my wife painted, hung up in a salon for the mob to stare at. Belonging to another man. For of course I couldn't buy the picture. So even if you had wanted to be painted, Moonlight, your tyrannous husband would not have permitted it. Tierney was a bit squiffy. He isn't used to being turned down like that. His requests are almost like royalties. But we are outlaws, laughed Valency. We bow to no decrees, we acknowledge no sovereignty. In her heart she thought unashamedly, I wish Olive could know that Alan Tierney wanted to paint me. Me. Little old maid Valency Sterling that was. Her second wonder moment came one evening in May. She realized that Barney actually liked her. She had always hoped he did, but sometimes she had a little, disagreeable, haunting dread that he was just kind and nice and chummy out of pity, knowing that she hadn't longed to live and determined she should have a good time as long as she did live, but away back in his mind rather looking forward to freedom again with no intrusive woman creature in his island fastness and no chattering thing beside him in his woodland prowls. She knew he could never love her. She did not even want him to. If he loved her he would be unhappy when she died, Valency never flinched from the plain word. No, passing away, for her. And she did not want him to be the least unhappy. But neither did she want him to be glad, or relieved. 
She wanted him to like her and miss her as a good chum. But she had never been sure until this night that he did. They had walked over the hills in the sunset. They had the delight of discovering a virgin spring in a ferny hollow and had drunk together from it out of a birch bark cup, they had come to an old tumble-down rail fence and sat on it for a long time. They didn't talk much, but Valancy had a curious sense of oneness. She knew that she couldn't have felt that if he hadn't liked her. You nice little thing, said Barney suddenly. Oh, you nice little thing. Sometimes I feel you're too nice to be real, that I'm just dreaming you. Why can't I die now, this very minute, when I am so happy, thought Valancy. Well, it couldn't be so very long now. Somehow, Valancy had always felt she would live out the year Dr. Trent had allotted. She had not been careful, she had never tried to be. But, somehow, she had always counted on living out her year. She had not let herself think about it at all. But now, sitting here beside Barney, with her hand in his, a sudden realization came to her. She had not had a heart attack for a long while, two months at least. The last one she had had was two or three nights before Barney was out in the storm. Since then she had not remembered she had a heart. Well, no doubt, it betokened the nearness of the end. Nature had given up the struggle. There would be no more pain. I'm afraid heaven will be very dull after this past year, thought Valancy. But perhaps one will not remember. Would that be, nice? No, no. I don't want to forget Barney. I'd rather be miserable in heaven remembering him than happy forgetting him. And I'll always remember through all eternity, that he really, really liked me. Chapter 35 30 seconds can be very long sometimes. Long enough to work a miracle or a revolution. In 30 seconds life changed wholly for Barney and Valancy Snaith. They had gone around the lake one June evening in their disappearing propeller, fished for an hour in a little creek, left their boat there, and walked up through the woods to Port Lawrence two miles away. Valancy prowled a bit in the shops and got herself a new pair of sensible shoes. Her old pair had suddenly and completely given out, and this evening she had been compelled to put on the little fancy pair of patent leather with rather high, slender heels, which she had bought in a fit of folly one day in the winter because of their beauty and because she wanted to make one foolish, extravagant purchase in her life. She sometimes put them on of an evening in the blue castle, but this was the first time she had worn them outside. She had not found it any too easy walking up through the woods in them, and Barney guide her unmercifully about them. But in spite of the inconvenience, Valancy secretly rather liked the look of her trim ankles and high instep above those pretty, foolish shoes and did not change them in the shop as she might have done. The sun was hanging low above the pines when they left Port Lawrence. To the north of it the woods closed around the town quite suddenly. Valancy always had a sense of stepping from one world to another, from reality to fairyland, when she went out of Port Lawrence and in a twinkling found it shut off behind her by the armies of the Pines. A mile and a half from Port Lawrence there was a small railroad station with a little station house which at this hour of the day was deserted, since no local train was due. Not a soul was in sight when Barney and Valancy emerged from the woods. Off to the left a sudden curve in the track hid it from view, but over the treetops beyond, the long plume of smoke betokened the approach of a through train. The rails were vibrating to its thunder as Barney stepped across the switch. Valancy was a few steps behind him, loitering to gather June bells along the little, winding path. But there was plenty of time to get across before the train came. She stepped unconcernedly over the first rail. She could never tell how it happened. The ensuing thirty seconds always seemed in her recollection like a chaotic nightmare in which she endured the agony of a thousand lifetimes. The heel of her pretty, foolish shoe caught in a crevice of the switch. She could not pull it loose. Barney, Barney, she called in alarm. Barney turned, saw her predicament, saw her ashen face, dashed back. He tried to pull her clear, 
he tried to wrench her foot from the prisoning hold. In vain. In a moment the train would sweep around the curve, would be on them. Go, go, quick, you'll be killed, Barney, shrieked Valancy, trying to push him away. Barney dropped on his knees, ghost white, frantically tearing at her shoelace. The knot defied his trembling fingers. He snatched a knife from his pocket and slashed at it. Valancy still strove blindly to push him away. Her mind was full of the hideous thought that Barney was going to be killed. She had no thought for her own danger. Barney, go, go, for God's sake, go. Never, muttered Barney between his set teeth. He gave one mad wrench at the lace. As the train thundered around the curve he sprang up and caught Valancy, dragging her clear, leaving the shoe behind her. The wind from the train as it swept by turned to icy cold the streaming perspiration on his face. Thank God, he breathed. For a moment they stood stupidly staring at each other, two white, shaken, wild-eyed creatures. Then they stumbled over to the little seat at the end of the station house and dropped on it. Barney buried his face in his hands and said not a word. Valancy sat, staring straight ahead of her with unseeing eyes at the great pine woods, the stumps of the clearing, the long, gleaming rails. There was only one thought in her dazed mind, a thought that seemed to burn it as a shaving of fire might burn her body. Dr. Trent had told her over a year ago that she had a serious form of heart disease, that any excitement might be fatal. If that were so, why was she not dead now? This very minute? She had just experienced as much and as terrible excitement as most people experience in a lifetime, crowded into that endless thirty seconds. Yet she had not died of it. She was not an iota the worse for it. A little wobbly at the knees, as anyone would have been, a quicker heartbeat, as anyone would have, nothing more. Why? Was it possible Dr. Trent had made a mistake? Valancy shivered as if a cold wind had suddenly chilled her to the soul. She looked at Barney, hunched up beside her. His silence was very eloquent. Had the same thought occurred to him? Did he suddenly find himself confronted by the appalling suspicion that he was married, not for a few months or a year, but for good and all to a woman he did not love and who had foisted herself upon him by some trick or lie? Valancy turned sick before the horror of it. It could not be. It would be too cruel, too devilish. Dr. Trent couldn't have made a mistake. Impossible. He was one of the best heart specialists in Ontario. She was foolish, unnerved by the recent horror. She remembered some of the hideous spasms of pain she had had. There must be something serious the matter with her heart to account for them. But she had not had any for nearly three months. Why? Presently Barney bestirred himself. He stood up, without looking at Valancy, and said casually, I suppose we'd better be hiking back. Sun's getting low. Are you good for the rest of the road? I think so, said Valancy miserably. Barney went across the clearing and picked up the parcel he had dropped, the parcel containing her new shoes. He brought it to her and let her take out the shoes and put them on without any assistance, while he stood with his back to her and looked out over the pines. They walked in silence down the shadowy trail to the lake. In silence Barney steered his boat into the sunset miracle that was Mistawi's. In silence they went around feathery headlands and across coral bays and silver rivers where canoes were slipping up and down in the afterglow. In silence they went past cottages echoing with music and laughter. In silence drew up at the landing place below the blue castle. Valancy went up the rock steps and into the house. She dropped miserably on the first chair she came to and sat there staring through the oriel, oblivious of good luck's frantic purrs of joy and Banjo's savage glares of protest at her occupancy of his chair. Barney came in a few minutes later. He did not come near her, but he stood behind her and asked gently if she felt any the worse for her experience. Valancy would have given her year of happiness to have been able honestly to answer, yes. 
No, she said flatly. Barney went into Bluebeard's chamber and shut the door. She heard him pacing up and down, up and down. He had never paced like that before. And an hour ago, only an hour ago, she had been so happy. Chapter 36 Finally Valency went to bed. Before she went she reread Dr. Trent's letter. It comforted her a little. So positive. So assured. The writing so black and steady. Not the writing of a man who didn't know what he was writing about. But she could not sleep. She pretended to be asleep when Barney came in. Barney pretended to go to sleep. But Valency knew perfectly well he wasn't sleeping any more than she was. She knew he was lying there, staring through the darkness. Thinking of what? Trying to face, what? Valency, who had spent so many happy wakeful hours of night lying by that window, now paid the price of them all in this one night of misery. A horrible, portentous fact was slowly looming out before her from the nebula of surmise and fear. She could not shut her eyes to it, push it away, ignore it. There could be nothing seriously wrong with her heart, no matter what Dr. Trent had said. If there had been, those thirty seconds would have killed her. It was no use to recall Dr. Trent's letter and reputation. The greatest specialists made mistakes sometimes. Dr. Trent had made one. Towards morning Valency fell into a fitful dose with ridiculous dreams. One of them was of Barney taunting her with having tricked him. In her dream she lost her temper and struck him violently on the head with her rolling pin. He proved to be made of glass and shivered into splinters all over the floor. She woke with a cry of horror, a gasp of relief, a short laugh over the absurdity of her dream, a miserable sickening recollection of what had happened. Barney was gone. Valency knew, as people sometimes know things, inescapably, without being told, that he was not in the house or in Bluebeard's chamber either. There was a curious silence in the living room. A silence with something uncanny about it. The old clock had stopped. Barney must have forgotten to wind it up, something he had never done before. The room without it was dead, though the sunshine streamed in through the aureole and dimples of light from the dancing waves beyond quivered over the walls. The canoe was gone but Lady Jane was under the mainland trees. So Barney had Beta Ken himself to the wilds. He would not return till night, perhaps not even then. He must be angry with her. That furious silence of his must mean anger, cold, deep, justifiable resentment. Well, Valency knew what she must do first. She was not suffering very keenly now. Yet the curious numbness that pervaded her being was in a way worse than pain. It was as if something in her had died. She forced herself to cook and eat a little breakfast. Mechanically she put the blue castle in perfect order. Then she put on her hat and coat, locked the door and hid the key in the hollow of the old pine and crossed to the mainland in the motorboat. She was going into Deerwood to see Dr. Trent. She must know. Chapter 37 Dr. Trent looked at her blankly and fumbled among his recollections. Air, Miss, Miss, Mrs. Snaith, said Valency quietly. I was Miss Valency Sterling when I came to you last May, over a year ago. I wanted to consult you about my heart. Dr. Trent's face cleared. Oh, of course. I remember now. I'm really not to blame for not knowing you. You've changed, splendidly. And married. Well, well, it has agreed with you. You don't look much like an invalid now, hey? I remember that day. I was badly upset. Hearing about poor Ned bowled me over. But Ned's as good as new and you, too, evidently. I told you so, you know, told you there was nothing to worry over. Valency looked at him. You told me, in your letter, she said slowly, with a curious feeling that someone else was talking through her lips, that I had angina pectoris, in the last stages, complicated with an aneurysm. 
that I might die any minute, that I couldn't live longer than a year. Dr. Trent stared at her. Impossible, he said blankly. I couldn't have told you that. Valancy took his letter from her bag and handed it to him. Miss Valancy Sterling, he read. Yes, yes. Of course I wrote you, on the train, that night. But I told you there was nothing serious, read your letter, insisted Valancy. Dr. Trent took it out, unfolded it, glanced over it. A dismayed look came into his face. He jumped to his feet and strode agitatedly about the room. Good heavens! This is the letter I meant for old Miss Jane Sterling. From Port Lawrence. She was here that day, too. I sent you the wrong letter. What unpardonable carelessness! But I was beside myself that night. My God, and you believed that, you believed, but you didn't, you went to another doctor, Valancy stood up, turned round, looked foolishly about her and sat down again. I believed it, she said faintly. I didn't go to any other doctor. I, I, it would take too long to explain. But I believed I was going to die soon. Dr. Trent halted before her. I can never forgive myself. What a year you must have had. But you don't look, I can't understand. Never mind, said Valancy dully. And so there's nothing the matter with my heart? Well, nothing serious. You had what is called pseudoangina. It's never fatal, passes away completely with proper treatment. Or sometimes with a shock of joy. Have you been troubled much with it? Not at all since March, answered Valancy. She remembered the marvelous feeling of recreation she had had when she saw Barney coming home safe after the storm. Had that shock of joy cured her? Then likely you're all right. I told you what to do in the letter you should have got. And of course I supposed you'd go to another doctor. Child, why didn't you? I didn't want anybody to know. Idiot, said Dr. Trent bluntly. I can't understand such folly. And poor old Miss Sterling. She must have got your letter, telling her there was nothing serious the matter. Well, well, it couldn't have made any difference. Her case was hopeless. Nothing that she could have done or left undone could have made any difference. I was surprised she lived as long as she did, two months. She was here that day, not long before you. I hated to tell her the truth. You think I'm a blunt old curmudgeon, and my letters are blunt enough. I can't soften things. But I'm a sniveling coward and it comes to telling a woman face to face that she's got to die soon. I told her I'd look up some features of the case I wasn't quite sure of and let her know next day. But you got her letter, look here, dear Mrs. Strlng, yes. I noticed that. But I thought it a mistake. I didn't know there were any Sterlings in Port Lawrence. She was the only one. A lonely old soul. Lived by herself with only a little home girl. She died two months after she was here, died in her sleep. My mistake couldn't have made any difference to her. But you. I can't forgive myself for inflicting a year's misery on you. It's time I retired, all right, when I do things like that, even if my son was supposed to be fatally injured. Can you ever forgive me? A year of misery. Valancy smiled a tortured smile as she thought of all the happiness Dr. Trent's mistake had bought her. But she was paying for it now, oh, she was paying. If to feel was to live she was living with a vengeance. She let Dr. Trent examine her and answered all his questions. When he told her she was fit as a fiddle and would probably live to be a hundred, she got up and went away silently. She knew that there were a great many horrible things outside waiting to be thought over. Dr. Trent thought she was odd. Anybody would have thought, from her hopeless eyes and woebegone face, that he had given her a sentence of death instead of life. Snaith? Snaith? Who the devil had she married? He had never heard of Snaith's in Deerwood. 
and she had been such a sallow, faded, little old maid. Gad, but marriage had made a difference in her, anyhow, whoever Snaith was. Snaith? Dr. Trent remembered. That rapscallion up back. Had Valancy Sterling married him? And her clan had let her. Well, probably that solved the mystery. She had married in haste and repented at leisure, and that was why she wasn't overjoyed at learning she was a good insurance prospect, after all. Married? To God knew whom? Or what? Jailbird? Defaulter? Fugitive from justice? It must be pretty bad if she had looked to death as a release, poor girl. But why were women such fools? Dr. Trent dismissed Valancy from his mind, though to the day of his death he was ashamed of putting those letters into the wrong envelopes. Chapter 38 Valancy walked quickly through the back streets and through Lover's Lane. She did not want to meet anyone she knew. She didn't want to meet even people she didn't know. She hated to be seen. Her mind was so confused, so torn, so messy. She felt that her appearance must be the same. She drew a sobbing breath of relief as she left the village behind and found herself on the up-back road. There was little fear of meeting anyone she knew here. The cars that fled by her with raucous shrieks were filled with strangers. One of them was packed with young people who whirled past her singing uproariously, My wife has the fever, oh then, my wife has the fever, oh then, my wife has the fever, oh, I hope it won't leave her, for I want to be single again. Valancy flinched as if one of them had leaned from the car and cut her across the face with a whip. She had made a covenant with death and death had cheated her. Now life stood mocking her. She had trapped Barney. Trapped him into marrying her. And divorce was so hard to get in Ontario. So expensive. And Barney was poor. With life, fear had come back into her heart. Sickening fear. Fear of what Barney would think. Would say. Fear of the future that must be lived without him. Fear of her insulted, repudiated clan. She had had one draught from a divine cup and now it was dashed from her lips. With no kind, friendly death to rescue her. She must go on living and longing for it. Everything was spoiled, smirched, defaced. Even that year in the Blue Castle. Even her unashamed love for Barney. It had been beautiful because death waited. Now it was only sordid because death was gone. How could anyone bear an unbearable thing? She must go back and tell him. Make him believe she had not meant to trick him, she must make him believe that. She must say goodbye to her blue castle and return to the brick house on Elm Street. Back to everything she had thought left behind forever. The old bondage, the old fears. But that did not matter. All that mattered now was that Barney must somehow be made to believe she had not consciously tricked him. When Valancy reached the pines by the lake she was brought out of her days of pain by a startling sight. There, parked by the side of old, battered ragged Lady Jane, was another car. A wonderful car. A purple car. Not a dark, royal purple but a blatant, screaming purple. It shone like a mirror and its interior plainly indicated the car cast of Vere de Vere. On the driver's seat sat a haughty chauffeur in livery. And in the tonneau sat a man who opened the door and bounced out nimbly as Valancy came down the path to the landing place. He stood under the pines waiting for her and Valancy took in every detail of him. A stout, short, pudgy man, with a broad, rubicund, good-humored face, a clean-shaven face, though an unparalyzed little imp at the back of Valancy's paralyzed mind suggested the thought, such a face should have a fringe of white whisker around it. Old-fashioned, steel-rimmed spectacles on prominent blue eyes. A pursy mouth, a little round, knobby nose. Where, 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 groped Valancy, had she seen that face before? It seemed as familiar to her as her own. 
The stranger wore a green hat and a light fawn overcoat over a suit of a loud check pattern. His tie was a brilliant green of lighter shade, on the plump hand he outstretched to intercept Valency an enormous diamond winked at her. But he had a pleasant, fatherly smile, and in his hearty, unmodulated voice was a ring of something that attracted her. Can you tell me, miss, if that house yonder belongs to a Mr. Redfern? And if so, how can I get to it? Redfern. A vision of bottles seemed to dance before Valency's eyes, long bottles of bitters, round bottles of hair tonic, square bottles of liniment, short, corpulent little bottles of purple pills, and all of them bearing that very prosperous, beaming moon face and steel-rimmed spectacles on the label. Dr. Redfern. No, said Valency faintly. No, that house belongs to Mr. Snaith. Dr. Redfern nodded. Yes, I understand Bernie's been calling himself Snaith. Well, it's his middle name, was his poor mother's. Bernard Snaith Redfern, that's him. And now, miss, you can tell me how to get over to that island? Nobody seems to be home there. I've done some waving and yelling. Henry, there, wouldn't yell. He's a one-job man. But old Doc Redfern can yell with the best of them yet, and ain't above doing it. Raised nothing but a couple of crows. Guess Bernie's out for the day. He was away when I left this morning, said Valency. I suppose he hasn't come home yet. She spoke flatly and tonelessly. This last shock had temporarily bereft her of whatever little power of reasoning had been left her by Dr. Trent's revelation. In the back of her mind the aforesaid little imp was jeeringly repeating a silly old proverb, it never rains but it pours. But she was not trying to think. What was the use? Dr. Redfern was gazing at her in perplexity. When you left this morning? Do you live, over there? He waved his diamond at the blue castle. Of course, said Valency stupidly. I'm his wife. Dr. Redfern took out a yellow silk handkerchief, removed his hat and mopped his brow. He was very bald, and Valency's imp whispered, Why be bald? Why lose your manly beauty? Try Redfern's hair vigor. It keeps you young. Excuse me, said Dr. Redfern. This is a bit of a shock. Shock seemed to be in the air this morning. The imp said this out loud before Valency could prevent it. I didn't know Bernie was, married. I didn't think he would have got married without telling his old dad. Were Dr. Redfern's eyes misty? Amid her own dull ache of misery and fear and dread, Valency felt a pang of pity for him. Don't blame him, she said hurriedly. It, it wasn't his fault. It, was all my doing. You didn't ask him to marry you, I suppose, twinkled Dr. Redfern. He might have let me know. I'd have got acquainted with my daughter-in-law before this if he had. But I'm glad to meet you now, my dear, very glad. You look like a sensible young woman. I used to sorter of fear Barney'd pick out some pretty bit of fluff just because she was good-looking. They were all after him, of course. Wanted his money? Eh. Didn't like the pills and the bitters but liked the dollars. Eh. Wanted to dip their pretty little fingers in old Doc's millions. Eh. Millions, said Valency faintly. She wished she could sit down somewhere, she wished she could have a chance to think, she wished she and the Blue Castle could sink to the bottom of Mistawis and vanish from human sight forevermore. Millions, said Dr. Redfern complacently. And Bernie chucks them for, that. Again he shook the diamond contemptuously at the blue castle. Wouldn't you think he'd have more sense? And all on account of a white bit of a girl. He must have got over that feeling, anyhow, since he's married. You must persuade him to come back to civilization. All nonsense wasting his life like this. Ain't you going to take me over to your house, my dear? I suppose you've some way of getting there. Of course, said Valency stupidly. 
She led the way down to the little cove where the disappearing propeller boat was snuggled. Does your, your man want to come, too? Who? Henry. Not he. Look at him sitting there disapproving. Disapproves of the whole expedition. The trail up from the road nearly gave him a conniption. Well, it was a devilish road to put a car on. Whose old bus is that up there? Barney's. Good lord. Does Bernie Redfern ride in a thing like that? It looks like the great-great-grandmother of all the Fords. It isn't a Ford. It's a Grey Slauson, said Valency spiritedly. For some occult reason, Dr. Redfern's good-humored ridicule of dear old Lady Jane stung her to life. A life that was all pain but still life. Better than the horrible half-dead and half-aliveness of the past few minutes, or years. She waved Dr. Redfern curtly into the boat and took him over to the Blue Castle. The key was still in the old pine, the house still silent and deserted. Valancy took the doctor through the living room to the western veranda. She must at least be out where there was air. It was still sunny, but in the southwest a great thundercloud, with white crests and gorges of purple shadow, was slowly rising over Mistawis. The doctor dropped with a gasp on a rustic chair and mopped his brow again. Warm, eh? Lord, what a view. Wonder if it would soften Henry if he could see it. Have you had dinner? asked Valancy. Yes, my dear, had it before we left Port Lawrence. Didn't know what sort of wild hermit's hollow we were coming to, you see. Hadn't any idea I was going to find a nice little daughter-in-law here all ready to toss me up a meal. Cats, eh? Puss, puss. See that? Cats love me. Bernie was always fond of cats. It's about the only thing he took from me. He's his poor mother's boy. Valancy had been thinking idly that Barney must resemble his mother. She had remained standing by the steps, but Dr. Redfern waved her to the swing seat. Sit down, dear. Never stand when you can sit. I want to get a good look at Barney's wife. Well, well, I like your face. No beauty, you don't mind my saying that, you've sense enough to know it, I reckon. Sit down. Valancy sat down. To be obliged to sit still when mental agony urges us to stride up and down is the refinement of torture. Every nerve in her being was crying out to be alone, to be hidden. But she had to sit and listen to Dr. Redfern, who didn't mind talking at all. When do you think Bernie will be back? I don't know, not before night probably. Where did he go? I don't know that either. Likely to the woods, up back. So he doesn't tell you his comings and goings, either? Bernie was always a secretive young devil. Never understood him. Just like his poor mother. But I thought a lot of him. It hurt me when he disappeared as he did. Eleven years ago. I haven't seen my boy for eleven years. Eleven years. Valancy was surprised. It's only six since he came here. Oh, he was in the Klondike before that, and all over the world. He used to drop me a line now and then, never give any clue to where he was but just a line to say he was all right. I suppose he's told you all about it. No. I know nothing of his past life, said Valancy with sudden eagerness. She wanted to know, she must know now. It hadn't mattered before. Now she must know all and she could never hear it from Barney. She might never even see him again. If she did, it would not be to talk of his past. What happened? Why did he leave his home? Tell me. Tell me. Well, it ain't much of a story. Just a young fool gone mad because of a quarrel with his girl. Only Barney was a stubborn fool. Always stubborn. You never could make that boy do anything he didn't want to do. From the day he was born. Yet he was always a quiet, gentle little chap, too. Good as gold. His poor mother died when he was only two years old. 
I'd just begun to make money with my hair vigor. I'd dream the formula for it, you see. Some dream that. The cash rolled in. Bernie had everything he wanted. I sent him to the best schools, private schools. I meant to make a gentleman of him. Never had any chance myself. Meant he should have every chance. He went through McGill. Got honors and all that. I wanted him to go in for law. He hankered after journalism and stuff like that. Wanted me to buy a paper for him, or back him in publishing what he called a real, worthwhile, honest-to-goodness Canadian magazine. I suppose I'd have done it, I always did what he wanted me to do. Wasn't he all I had to live for? I wanted him to be happy. And he never was happy. Can you believe it? Not that he said so. But I'd always a feeling that he wasn't happy. Everything he wanted, all the money he could spend, his own bank account, travel, seeing the world, but he wasn't happy. Not till he fell in love with Ethel Traverse. Then he was happy for a little while. The cloud had reached the sun and a great, chill, purple shadow came swiftly over Mistawis. It touched the blue castle, rolled over it. Valancy shivered. Yes, she said, with painful eagerness, though every word was cutting her to the heart. What, was, she, like? Prettiest girl in Montreal, said Dr. Redfern. Oh, she was a looker, all right. Eh. Gold hair, shiny as silk, great, big, soft, black eyes, skin like milk and roses. Don't wonder Bernie fell for her. And brains as well. She wasn't a bit of fluff. B. A., from McGill. A thoroughbred, too. One of the best families. But a bit lean in the purse. Eh. Bernie was mad about her. Happiest young fool you ever saw. Then, the bust up. What happened? Valency had taken off her hat and was absently thrusting a pin in and out of it. Good luck was purring beside her. Banjo was regarding Dr. Redfern with suspicion. Nip and Tuck were lazily cawing in the pines. Mistawis was beckoning. Everything was the same. Nothing was the same. It was a hundred years since yesterday. Yesterday, at this time, she and Barney had been eating a belated dinner here with laughter. Laughter? Valancy felt that she had done with laughter forever. And with tears, for that matter. She had no further use for either of them. Blessed if I know, my dear. Some fool quarrel, I suppose. Bernie just lit out, disappeared. He wrote me from the Yukon. Said his engagement was broken and he wasn't coming back. And not to try to hunt him up because he was never coming back. I didn't. What was the use? I knew Bernie. I went on piling up money because there wasn't anything else to do. But I was mighty lonely. All I lived for was them little notes now and then from Bernie, Klondike, England, South Africa, China, everywhere. I thought maybe he'd come back some day to his lonesome old dad. Then six years ago even the letters stopped. I didn't hear a word of or from him till last Christmas. Did he write? No. But he drew a check for $15,000 on his bank account. The bank manager is a friend of mine, one of my biggest shareholders. He'd always promised me he'd let me know if Bernie drew any checks. Bernie had 50000 there. And he'd never touched a cent of it till last Christmas. The check was made out to Ainsley's, Toronto, Ainsley's. Valancy heard herself saying Ainsley's. She had a box on her dressing table with the Ainsley trademark. Yes. The big jewelry house there. After I'd thought it over a while, I got brisk. I wanted to locate Bernie. Had a special reason for it. It was time he gave up his fool hoboing and come to his senses. Drawing that fifteen told me there was something in the wind. The manager communicated with the Ainsleys, 
his wife was in Ainsley, and found out that Bernard Redfern had bought a pearl necklace there. His address was given as Box 444, Port Lawrence, Muskoka, Ontario. First I thought I'd write. Then I thought I'd wait till the open season for cars and come down myself. Ain't no hand at writing. I've motored from Montreal. Got to Port Lawrence yesterday. Inquired at the post office. Told me they knew nothing of any Bernard Snaith Redfern, but there was a Barney Snaith had a P.O. box there. Lived on an island out here, they said. So here I am. And where's Barney? Valency was fingering her necklace. She was wearing $15,000 around her neck. And she had worried lest Barney had paid $15 for it and couldn't afford it. Suddenly she laughed in Dr. Redfern's face. Excuse me. It's so, amusing, said poor Valency. Isn't it, said Dr. Redfern, seeing a joke, but not exactly hers. Now, you seem like a sensible young woman, and I dare say you've lots of influence over Bernie. Can't you get him to come back to civilization and live like other people? I've a house up there. Big as a castle. Furnished like a palace. I want company in it, Bernie's wife, Bernie's children. Did Ethel Traverse ever marry, queried Valency irrelevantly. Bless you, yes. Two years after Bernie Levant. But she's a widow now. Pretty as ever. To be frank, that was my special reason for wanting to find Bernie. I thought they'd make it up, maybe. But, of course, that's all off now. Doesn't matter. Bernie's choice of a wife is good enough for me. It's my boy I want. Think he'll soon be back. I don't know. But I don't think he'll come before night. Quite late, perhaps. And perhaps not till tomorrow. But I can put you up comfortably. He'll certainly be back tomorrow. Dr. Redfern shook his head. Too damp. I'll take no chances with rheumatism. Why suffer that ceaseless anguish? Why not try Redfern's liniment, quoted the imp in the back of Valency's mind. I must get back to Port Lawrence before rain starts. Henry goes quite mad when he gets mud on the car. But I'll come back tomorrow. Meanwhile you talk Bernie into reason. He shook her hand and patted her kindly on the shoulder. He looked as if he would have kissed her, with a little encouragement, but Valency did not give it. Not that she would have minded. He was rather dreadful and loud, and, and, dreadful. But there was something about him she liked. She thought dully that she might have liked being his daughter-in-law if he had not been a millionaire. A score of times over. And Barney was his son, and heir. She took him over in the motorboat and watched the lordly purple car roll away through the woods with Henry at the wheel looking things not lawful to be uttered. Then she went back to the blue castle. What she had to do must be done quickly. Barney might return at any moment. And it was certainly going to rain. She was thankful she no longer felt very bad. When you are bludgeoned on the head repeatedly, you naturally and mercifully become more or less insensible and stupid. She stood briefly like a faded flower bitten by frost, by the hearth, looking down on the white ashes of the last fire that had blazed in the blue castle. At any rate, she thought wearily, Barney isn't poor. He will be able to afford a divorce. Quite nicely.